Hi, I'm B.B. Newarth, and this is some of my life in the theater. A chorus line, a chorus line, a chorus line, a chorus line, a chorus line. A chorus line was my very first professional equity job. I was on stage since I was six years old at McCarter Theatre in Princeton, um, doing ballets and some musicals. And then um, <clears throat> I auditioned for a chorus line. Actually, I, I went to uh, three open calls. The first one I went to when I was probably 18 and I got cut right away <laughs> and then the second one I get I got kept until I think the double pirouette and then I got cut I was still 18 and then in backstage and show business those they used to have these newspapers that you'd get and they would tell you you know the auditions and when to go and the open call non-equity, so I went to an open call. It said only, for a chorus line, only those who have not previously auditioned. And um, I had already auditioned twice, so I went a third time. <laughs> and uh, and eventually, um, you know, I got, I went and I got kept and I got kept and I got called back and then I got called back and got called back. And that was my very first job. And my final callback was at 890 Broadway, which had that time had, um, was not the rehearsal studios that it is now. It, um, Michael Bennett had just bought the building. And so the, the rehearsal studios weren't quite finished yet, but there was one and the floors were really slippery. <laughs> um, but anyway, that was where my final, final callback was. And I got the job and I, joined Equity, and it was 1978, and I, it was for the International Company of a Chorus Line. So that was, there were two companies touring the United States at the time. In 1978, it's only three years after the show opened, and uh, one was the National Company, one was the International, called that because they were the, they had been the London Company and had come back. So I joined them and I played um, Lois, the ballerina, who gets cut from the opening, and um, she is traditionally, and in my case also, um, the understudy for Sheila and Cassie. So I was <laughs> 19 years old, understudying Sheila and Cassie on the road, and um, it's fantastic. So I was on the road for almost two years, and after I played Lois for a while, I eventually took over the role of Sheila, and then, uh, still in the international company, and then I took over the role of Cassie, played Cassie on the road, on the road, and, um, and then I came into Broadway, where I played Lois for a few weeks, and then took over the role of Sheila on Broadway, and played it on Broadway for about a year, and uh, left the show at the ripe old age of 22. <laughs> and I thought, I'll never work again. <laughs> and um, yeah, a chorus line, near and very dear to my heart. And the blessing of having worked with Michael Bennett and countless other dancers in the show, dear friends I have to this day, um, many friends who were lost to the AIDS plague, but um, many dear friends still today. And I did, can I tell this story? I did get um, directed, you know, as direct, Michael Bennett would come out to the road and direct us. And I got, when I took over the role of Cassie, uh, he coached me on, you know, he directed me on the scene and also coached me on the dance. So I actually was on a stage dancing parts of the Cassie dance with Michael Bennett dancing next to me. And um, I, I, I haven't forgotten it yet, and I hope I never, ever, ever, till the end of my life, forget what that felt like. It's magnificent. Uh, dancing was a dream come true to be in that show because Bob Fosse's choreography is the reason that I wanted to be a Broadway dancer. 
I had always wanted to be a ballet dancer. I only studied ballet and only performed in ballets, started to do musical theater um, a little bit here and there. But when I saw Pippin on Broadway, I saw that choreography and, I, and I, I felt like I recognized myself on the stage. I felt like I feel that choreography in my bones and in my soul. And I, I know that, I am that, that's me. It just resonated so deeply. And I didn't know who Bob Fosse was. I didn't know that I was talking about God. I just went, I, that, me, I know that. I will do that. So I shifted my focus and said, I want to dance on Broadway. If, that, if that's where that choreography lives, I want to do that. And I also knew somewhere in the back of my mind, I was not going to be a professional ballet dancer. I just did not have that, but I had something. And when I saw Pippin, it answered the question of what it was that I had. And um, so it was, uh, just a magnificent experience doing that show. Incredibly, I eventually got to know and become friends with some of the people who were in Pippin that I saw when I was um, 13. I think I was 13 years old, yeah. 1972, at the Imperial Theater, yeah. So again, that's, uh, that's near and dear to my heart. <clears throat> Little me, Little Me was really fun. Little Me, some really wonderful things happened with that. Um, okay, it only lasted a month, but within that were some magnificent people in the cast, some great friends and some beautiful performers. And it was choreographed by Peter Gennaro, who was one, was one of the great gentlemen of the theater. Magnificent, um, human, kind, generous, um, just a, a beautiful, beautiful person. And it's also oddly how I met Bob Fosse because when we were doing this, Bob had uh, choreographed the original Little Me on Broadway. And in our revival, they felt that there was a little trouble with one of the numbers. It was the number called Deep Down Inside. And it's an entire ensemble and they, they thought, wouldn't it be great if we got Bob Fosse to come back and restage the original number? And so that's what they did. And so I remember being in previews and being feeling very, very torn because here was my, my idol, this person that, whose choreography was my reason for being in musical theater. I knew he was coming in, but I loved Peter Gennaro so much that I thought how, how I, I felt guilty about being excited that Mr. Fosse was coming in because I loved Peter. And Peter Gennaro did the most brilliant thing. We we're all sitting in the audience waiting for the arrival of Mr. Fosse to come and rehearse us. And Mr. Gennaro came in and he looked at all of us and he said, you listen to him because he knows. And there was such a lightness about him and such a, reverence for Fosse, and I was an idiot, I, completely ignorant. I didn't realize that he was one of the steam heat guys. I didn't know their history together. Um, but I was just struck by that respect for um, Bob, and also he gave us permission to work our very hardest for Mr. Fosse and do the very best we could. That gave it was really a, a really a wisdom of heart and mind in action. He's a beautiful, beautiful man. So that's little me, had a lot. Oh, and also the costumes. Oh my God, Tony Walton, working with Tony Walton, who I could just go on. Okay, I won't. What else is there? Upstairs at O'Neill's. Oh my God. Okay, this is crazy. I didn't know what I was doing there and they brought me in to audition for this um, comedy review. And uh, it was fabulous. And the, the auditions just went on and on and on and Martin Sharnan directed it. 
And he had us in different pairs and doing this sketch, and doing that sketch, and um, it was great. It was a comedy review in a tiny, on a, on a stage that was very, very small. This desk would have fit on it, but I don't know if you could have gotten another desk <laughs> on that stage. And, uh, and it was all wonderful, hilarious um, uh, comedy material. It was sketches and skits and funny songs. And it was modeled on the upstairs at the downstairs, on the Julius Monk upstairs at the downstairs. Look it up if your parents or grandparents haven't already told you about this. It was just great. And, and uh, it was also choreographed by Ed Love. Ed Love, who was a beautiful Fosse dancer and um, wonderful choreographer taken from us far too soon, but he was beautiful and the show was hilarious and it was, there was a lot of um, lessons that I kind of understood about comedy from, from doing that. Nobody teaches you comedy. You can't teach comedy. You're either funny or you're not funny. You have timing or you don't have timing, but there are some things that you can learn technically along the way, like, you know, things, everybody knows um, words that have the K sound in them, or things in threes are gonna be funnier. Um, also put, put the funny thing at the end of the sentence. All these just little things that are um, a little more nuanced than that as well. Um, so it was, a, it was a fantastic training um, and a really fun, interesting, uh, show to do that I had I'd never thought I'd be in a in a comedy review <laughs> it was great it was great uh, and then sweet charity um, sweet charity is uh, it just moves me so much to look at this um, to this at this playbill with Debbie Allen dear Debbie Allen on the cover um, that was just an incredible show, and, an, and it's such a it's such a bad adjective. It was incredible. It was profound. It was deeply moving to me. It was it taught me so much. It was um, it was a profound experience to be directed by Bob Fosse because one of the things that he did as a director that is a mark of a great director is he cast really well. If you look at any, th any of his casts and you see who he chose and you look at that person's work, you'll see, I think, the best work that they may have ever done was done in those roles, at least up until that point. Maybe they, you know, went on after that. But it's because we were, we were so well placed. We were, we were in, we were cast there because we had something that um, it just, I don't know how to say this. It, it was just right. It was just, it was brilliant, a brilliant casting. And so all you had to do was listen to what he said to do and do it, and you would give the best performance of your life. And Gwen Verdon taught us the choreography and coached us on the choreography. It, this is, this show was a gift from the universe saying, here, have something really um, spectacular. And um, I, 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 I know I ramble about a lot of these shows, and I find myself stumped because it's just so deep and so much is there. I loved it so much. I loved playing Nikki Pignatelli. She made me laugh and she broke my heart. And I think that's Maybe that's how I knew I was well cast because this person breaks my heart and makes me laugh. So uh, if you can delight in your character and also understand and have that character break your heart a little bit, I think you're, you're in the right place. Um, oh my God, and the costumes. Um, it, it was just everything. Everything about it was fabulous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Damn Yankees, Victor Garber.
is the first thing that comes to my mind when I see Damn Yankees. Victor Garber, who I worked with in Little Me. I just loved working with him so much. He made me laugh so hard. Backstage and on stage, there were times when I wasn't sure that we would be able to finish act one because I wasn't sure I could get my lines out or if Victor would be able to get his lines out because we were laughing so hard, trying not to laugh, laughing so hard. We were giggling. I loved him and I loved baseball. Um, Chicago, <laughs> oh yeah, that show. Chicago, okay, Chicago was being done at Encores, City Center Encores. I heard that it was being done, <clears throat> excuse me, and I had worked at City Center Encores uh, once before in their first or second season doing Pal Joey at Encores, City Center. And I heard that they were gonna do Chicago. And I went, oh. I worship that show. I had done Chicago at Long Beach Civic Light Opera with Juliet Prowse, choreographed by Annie Ranking and directed by Rob Marshall, Kay Ballard as Mama Morton. Oh my God, Michael O'Hockey, the original. Uh, uh, Mary Sunshine was playing Mary Sunshine. Barney Martin was playing Amos. It was incredible. Gary Sandy was Billy. It was a really wonderful production, and I played Velma, and I loved it so much. Heard that City Center Encores was gonna do it, and I did something. I am not a person, I'm not a go-getter. I'm not a, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I don't strategize, I don't, I'm not ambitious like that. I just wanna work. But this show, I went, okay, I'm gonna screw up my courage, and I'm gonna call Walter Bobby, who I was acquainted with, and I'm gonna say, and I did this, I said, I would like to be considered, I just would like to be considered for the role of Velma. And he said, you're at the top of the list. And I thought, great, that means I'm, you know, like number three, it must be, it must be one of the top three people. I think I was actually at literally the top of the list, but I didn't realize until many years later, I went, hey, wait a minute, I think he meant, so, uh, so we did it at City Center Encores, and it was, it, was, it was a supernatural experience. We didn't realize, we all loved the show. I saw the show when I was 15, and my parents afterwards said, you sure that's what you want to do? And I was like, yes, that's what I want to do. Um, every, you know, people loved it, but when the overture started and the audience at City Center went nuts, it, we looked around backstage going, oh, oh, they, this is, oh. And then the show started and, and, and I think it was when, when Michael Barras popped up and said, the cell, introduced the cell block tango. And before we did anything, like the roof came off of the, of the city center, the love for John Kander and Fred Ebb was, you could light up this city for a week with the energy of the love that was coming out of that audience for them. It was just incredible. And we just, our cast, we just rode on it. We rode it, we knew how lucky we were to be with each other. That was an unusual cast. We'd, almost all of us had worked together before. Almost all of us were connected to Bob and Gwen in some way. Almost all of us had very strong relationships with each other. We just rode that going, we are lucky, lucky people, and this is, this is heaven. And, and then the rumors start coming around backstage because it keeps going like that all weekend. Like, oh, we're going to Broadway, we're going to Broadway. <laughs> yeah, 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 we're going to Broadway. <laughs> There's an old saying, I'll believe we're going to Broadway when I see the closing notice. So I thought, yeah, we're going to Broadway. And I didn't dare believe that. And um, it went to Broadway and it was just incredible and continues to be incredible. And I was in the show playing Velma for maybe, it was about at the year mark. I'd already been doing it for about a year, a little over a year. And dear John Minio, 
um, who was in that original Pippin that I saw when I was 13 and I became quite friendly with and uh, was a beautiful, beautiful dancer, um, gone too soon. But he said to me, you know, you've got a tough show. And I thought, I do? This is, this is a hard show? Film is a hard show? I hadn't considered it because it was so well crafted. The show is so well crafted. The role of Vel Velma is so well crafted. I mean, I knew it was aerobic, running around the stage and carrying that the chair over my head and all that, but I hadn't considered that it was tough because it was such excellent material. Well, Fosse, I was very, very grateful to be able to do Fosse. I was very grateful to be able to dance Steam Heat on Broadway. I was grateful to be able to do Blackbird on Broadway. I was so grateful to do that show. Um, it was a beautiful, beautiful tribute to him. And um, I just loved it. And uh, one of my, one of the memories that I have to share with you about doing it was not actually doing the show, but doing some press for the show. Because when I went into the show, um, Annie Ranking was doing the show, and she was coming out and I was going in, we were gonna overlap, <clears throat> excuse me, and we were gonna do the show together for, I don't know, it was a couple weeks or a month, I, I can't remember exactly. But we did some press together, and we did a, a photo shoot together. And we were both dressed in, mine hair costumes and and you know annie was doing she had some uh pose like this and i had some pose with a with a bowl or something and we would go back and forth with these pose and um thinking of different things to do at one point we were just standing around like this <laughs> please no one got offended but i just reached around her head like this for the Polaroid, and I went like this to her, and she had that devilish little grin on her face, and she's like this to me. <laughs> and it's, I have many, many photographs of me and my dear friend, Anne Ranking. That is one of my favorite photographs <laughs> because we're both having such a good time and we're both giggling on each other and it's great. She used to say, we're like salt and pepper, but I don't know which is which. Oh God, and when I went into, when I went into Fosse, I went into a dressing room that had been occupied by Ben Vereen, another idol who had been starring in Pippin when I first saw what my life was gonna be. And it smelled like him and it smelled so beautiful. It was just wonderful. He had the most wonderful incense. Okay, the exonerated. That was, um, I can't, I, sometimes I've done things, I don't know how I got so lucky, you know, just some dancer coming in and doing a piece as profound and important and stunning as The Exonerated, but um, I got to do that and um, Bob Balaban asked me to come in and um, be one of the readers kind of embody, you know, we read the stories of these people who had been exonerated from death row. And uh, it was just a very, very moving experience. I felt very uh, honored to be there and very, very grateful that I could uh, be a part of that. So, uh, writer's block was uh, two one-act plays at the Atlantic Theatre Company. And um, <clears throat> great theatre company, great theatre. And they were both written by Woody Allen and both directed by Woody Allen. And he just made me laugh so hard. And I would, I would write down, when he would give us notes, I'd write down things that he said because they were just so damn funny. <laughs> like, <laughs> things like, you should be actively begging the audience for a laugh on this line. <laughs> it goes against everything that you're supposed to do, but it just made sense when Woody said it. And uh, 
I loved it. It was it was a lot of fun. I also liked uh, hanging out with him and talking about Bob Hope and old comics, and um, that was very very pleasant. And it was designed by Santa Laquasto, who had designed um, those wonderful uh, uh, mine hair costumes. He had designed Fosse, and um, he's he's. A, another wonderful gentleman of the theater and really, really loved working with him. Okay, Here Lies Jenny is, this show means so much to me. Um, <clears throat> there was, uh, I don't even know how to tell this story. There was some noise being made and you know, from my agents and other places, like I should do a concert, you know, sing a concert or something like that. and. Um, I didn't want to sing a concert. I like being on stage with other people and, um, you know, playing characters and stuff. And I just didn't, I didn't understand what that was. And <clears throat> I had a friend said, I, I, I love court vile music. I went to my dear friend, Leslie Stifelman, music director. I said, I have this music. I, I, I don't know what, what to do with it. She said, do you know any directors? that you could just bring them the material and maybe they could have an idea what to do with it. And I said, it was very good advice. So I said, well, one of my dear treasured friends is Roger Rees. He's a director. And we had, Roger and I had done a show in Los Angeles on an even smaller stage than the one upstairs at O'Neill's was on um, at the Itchy Foot. And it was, it was all Weimar era, uh, cabaret material, and we had done some um, some court vial there, and we had found uh, we had bonded even more. We had a, a friendship anyway, but we bonded even more over our shared love of that period and that aesthetic and that music. So I thought, Roger, I'll, I'll ask Roger. And Leslie said, Yeah, okay, Roger Rees, sure. So. Roger came over and sat on the sofa in Leslie's living room, and I sang through a bunch of um, uh, court file material. Um, I didn't have to do some of them because he knew them already. We'd done them together. And he said, okay, here's what happens. And then he proceeded to tell the story of what Here Lies Jenny was going to be, that we were in a dive bar in an, uh, some Port City at some time, some era, you know, not, not particular, but um, universal. And it's run down, it's a dive, there's a bartender, there's, there's a couple of brutes there, and this woman shows up and she's got a duffel bag with, and he tells the entire story and she starts to sing uh, the Bill Bow song as she sees this place that maybe she recognizes, maybe she does It was such a beautiful piece um, where each song, there was no text, but each song was necessitated by the song before it. And it was a little bit abstract, a little bit impressionistic, but there you could tell what, you knew what was going on. It was deeply emotional. Um, the guys were magnificent. Uh, Greg Butler and Sean Amamjame and Ed Dixon and Leslie Stifelman on the piano. And it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful piece of theater. And I had also said to him, you know, I don't want to play, you know, the smart girl anymore. I don't, I want to be, you know, I, nobody ever cast me as vulnerable. Nobody ever, I <laughs> just, I'm a wuss. But they think I'm tough and hard, and I don't want to. I don't. I want something where I can be romantic. I can be. I can be pathetic. I can be, you know, something. So everything was in Here Lies Jenny. Everything was there, and Annie Ranking choreographed it and made some of the most beautiful. Oh, she made a tango to the Yukali tango that went dancing with one guy to dancing with another, with the two guys dancing together, with the dancing with the two guys. It was, she did beautiful work. It was a very, very beautiful experience in a tiny little theater called the Zipper Theater, which no longer exists. And um, it was beautiful. 
Okay, so here's Chicago again. I got to go back and play. Uh, I went back and I played Velma a couple of times, like every year for maybe like three or four years. I'd go back for a month or two. Um, uh, <laughs> really fortunate to do that. And then there was uh, some time that I didn't. I was doing some other things. I was also having a lot of uh, problem with a hip. And when I had my first hip replacement, I went to Barry Weisler and I said, um, can I play Roxy? <laughs> and he went, oh, uh, yeah, I think so, Fran. What do you think of me playing Roxy? And she went, yes. And so I played Roxy. It was about, it was six months after my first hip replacement. And my first night was my, on my birthday, New Year's Eve. And uh, it was a birthday present to myself to say, I am not done dancing. I've got some titanium in my, in my hip, but I'm not done. And it was uh, very, very grateful that I could go back and play Roxy. And that was really interesting to see the show from stage left <laughs> or stage right. It was, it was very, very interesting. What's interesting is that Roxy is on stage much longer and much more than Velma is. But Velma is a harder role to play. What is required of Roxy is that she starts the show in a very low place, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> and through the course of the evening, everything's great for her. Now she's got a world full of yes. It used to be no, 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 and she says it. Now I got me a world full of yes, and everything goes like that. So it does something to the performer. Velma starts the show on top of the world, and then it all comes crashing down. And she spends the entire two and a half hours desperately trying to get back on top. And, she, and it's, I think that is reflected in the choreography. You know, my sister and I, oh my God, and then I'd, and then I'd, and then I'd, and then I'd. She's desperately trying to get this girl to do the show with her. And then here's what I'm gonna do on the witness stand. And, that chair weighs 40 pounds. And this is what I'm gonna, you know, so she's desperately trying to, and also anytime Velma's on stage, she's shot out of a cannon. And then she, you know, so there's nothing that leads, segues into each number. It's just like, bam, mama, I got an idea. My sister and I had an act that could, you know, and it, it's like that. With Roxy, it's a little bit more of a gentle ride. I'm not saying it's easy because it's not easy, but there's something about Velma that is physically more demanding. La la la, the Adams Family. I love the Adams Family. When I was a little girl, I always wanted to be Morticia Adams. That was a role model. That's the kind of kid I was. I thought Carolyn Jones as Morticia, that she was, there were a couple of women on television who embodied glamour and beauty and elegance. Uh, Nichelle Nichols was another one as Uhura in Star Trek, and um, Carolyn Jones, I would say, like, those two were my idols of, that's, I want to be like that. And, um, and I also knew the cartoons, you know, the, the actual cartoons. So I was, I was thrilled to play Morticia Adams, and then I got to play Morticia Adams with my dear Roger Rees. And uh, we loved being on stage together. So it was, it was, uh, was great. And they gave me a fabulous costume to wear. <laughs> and here's Chicago. And I guess I was playing Mama in this one. <laughs> um, I loved playing Mama. It was a very, I, uh, it was surprising how I felt. I didn't realize I would feel that way when I played Mama. I felt very maternal. There's no other word for it. I'd sit on the side um, in her little bentwood chair and I'd watch the girls and I actually did feel maternal toward them. I was old enough to be their mother at that point and I really, I really felt for the girls and uh, it was great. I really enjoyed it and I love doing that hunyak scene. Marsha Lewis was one of the bright lights of um, our show. 
uh, of that original company. She was a beautiful person and we all loved her very, very much. And uh, it was uh, a terrible loss. And I was honored to be able to play that part also. Yeah. <clears throat> the bedwetter. <laughs> I, I got to work at the Atlantic Theater Company again, and I got to play Sarah Silverman's Nana. I got to play her grandmother, and I loved playing her. I, I think it's a, a fascinating piece of theater. I think it's a really interesting uh, show. Joshua Harmon wrote it with Sarah, and... Um, it's it's wonderful. Zoe Glickstein was our Sarah at the time. I think she's, it's terrible. These girls, they're little girls, and then, oh, we're going to do the show again. And then they're like this tall, and then what do you do? No, I love playing uh, Sarah's grandmother. I loved her telling me things about her. I love Sarah. She's just so nice and so sweet and so collaborative and so supportive. You know, she'd watch us do a run-through or just run a scene and she'd go, oh, <laughs> go, wow, thanks, Sarah. Really, that's what you want from anyone, especially if you're playing their loved ones. Um, she was wonderful. So I, I got to play this uh, woman who drank too much and smoked too much and um, loved her granddaughter. And uh, it was a very interesting character. So I loved it, I had a great time. Um, cabaret. This is cabaret. <laughs> I, I, I haven't even started rehearsals yet, and I can't wait. I admire the uh, other people who are in it so much, and I have to say, when they told me that Stephen Skybell was going to play. Um, uh, Herr Schultz, I uh, literally, in the real sense of that word, I literally got tears in my eyes because I love Stephen Skybell so much. I think he's so brilliant and, and he's one of the kindest, most generous people on stage and off. I did a Midsummer Night's Dream with him and he played Bottom and I played Titania. Uh, and I, we doubled the Titania and Hippolyta, and we, uh, uh, so I have been on stage with him, and he's just fantastic. There's people you're on stage with where you're like, they're really good, and this is really fun, and that's great, and I look forward to working with them again. And then there are people you're on stage with, you know, like Roger Rees, um, like Annie Ranking, uh, and Stephen Skybell, where you go, oh my God, this is, this is what it's all about. And man, I, I just think he's amazing. And his performance as Tevya in the Yiddish Fiddler on the Roof, I saw several times. And I think that was, uh, I think his work in that was a masterpiece. I really think that he plumbed the depths of a character that made me feel and see things that were just, just extraordinary. And it was in Yiddish, and I don't speak Yiddish. I'm Jewish, but I don't speak Yiddish. But the subtitles were in um, English and Russian, and uh, which I found very moving. But it was just, he's magnificent. He is absolutely magnificent. I, I can't believe how lucky I am to be able to get back on a stage with him. And to hang out backstage with him is just the nicest guy. And I've had a couple of costume meetings and it's getting very exciting. You know what, they brought me in for the part. They said, oh, go, go in and, and meet this director, Rebecca. I said, okay. 
So I put on my little suit and I went in and I met this woman and the, one of the first things she says to me is, I love musical theater, a chorus line. I grew up with a chorus line. I was like, wow, we are gonna be, this is great. And we just chatted and talked and talked and she was, I, I just didn't wanna leave. It was, and it was no longer about meeting a director for a you know, possible position in their show, it was just, meeting this wonderful person that I just wanted to listen to her ideas and thoughts about theater and life for hours. She was wonderful. So I was very excited when they say, would you come back and sing? I said, sure, is she going to be there? Sure. <laughs> so I'm very grateful.